Welcome, welcome, welcome. You're listening to KHS 1220 and 98.1 FM in Los Angeles. Well, every week we try to have a very, very good show about business, trying to teach people business lessons, and that's called the Ask Brian Radio Show. It's A-S-K-B-R-I-E-N. People that have listened to the show, they know what the E stands for. Uh, our co-host should know what the E stands for. In fact, <laughs> for today, we decided we're going to ask the co-host what the E stands for and ask Brian. Go! Elizabeth, my middle name. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Which I, say, which I say with enthusiasm and energetically, um, uh, yeah, that. <laughs> Well, that, that's, a, that's a start, but, you know, I, I'm not going to be, you know, flipping any fish for you, so, uh, uh, <laughs> as, as a seal, so you'll have to get a little bit more than that. So why in the world do we spell Brian with an E, and you've given us a couple of reasons. One, your middle name is Elizabeth, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then we've got... It's my job to surprise you and keep you on your toes. It's my job. And then... And then the other reasons why you like it is because it's very excitable, and then also <laughs> it has a lot of enthusiasm, right? And our engineer. Do not forget our lovely engineer. Thank you, Tracy. Who is that? It's me. It's Patty. Patty? <laughs> Patty the engineer, yeah. I think it's more like Patty O'Brien, and because Brian is spelled well, with an E well, in Ireland, that's why you spelled Brian with an E. Well, top of the morning to you, then. Tip of the morning. <laughs> <laughs> hope you had a hope you had a great uh, St. Patty's Day, even though it's been a while. <laughs> it's been about a week. You seen any leprechauns? <laughs> no, not recently. I All wish. Right. All right. So, what are the other reasons why we spell Brian with an E, Tracy? Oh, okay. So, experts and everyone that's uh, featured on Ask Brian, as well as the two of us uh, hosting Ask Brian, are experts in our industry and in our field. So we put in our more than 10,000 hours to be considered experts or else we lie about it. I don't know, maybe. Nobody would lie. I watched Leave It to, I watched Leave it to Beaver when I was a kid. We don't lie. <laughs> I feel, I feel like I put 10,000 hours a week into being an expert, so I think we're good. <laughs> well, that's not even enough, but what are the other reasons? Or do we have to ask the engineer? I think you should just make sure that Patty gets his voice in the situation as well. <laughs> <laughs> You're on the clock. Remember, <laughs> KHCS, <laughs> KHCS 1220 and 98.1 FM. Like no other station in the world! All right. What are the reasons? All right, well, I think Tracy did cover enthusiasm, excitement. Uh, she did take the engineer, and she did put experts. Uh, so we got four. I uh, do have a couple more. Uh, one of them is effort because uh, we do give more than 110% effort on everything we do here on the Ask Brian Show. And then, uh, let's see, that's five. Was there, I think there was six, wasn't there's there? There's two more. There's two more. There's two more. Experts in experts uh, effort. Uh, oh, you know what? Empathy. You were not being very empathetic with Tracy, and yeah, no, you weren't being very empathetic. You were I, not. I was completely empathetic. Were you? I'm just not. I'm, I'm just not empathetic with you. Yeah, no, that 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 that, that sounds actually more likely the story. Yes. But you have one more. And one more. Let's see. Excitement, enthusiasm, effort, experts. Uh, of course, know. we're excellent. <laughs> Ah, excellence. That's true. That is true. I didn't know we were having a pop quiz today. <laughs> uh, uh, Pro Professor Brian is in. And Professor Brian <laughs> has a very, very enthusiastic and established guest on today. And, and an expert. And, and an engineer. He's, uh, I don't think he's an engineer. I think he is, a front-end engineer. I thought he was an artist. Anyway, Daniel, you're there. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. I'm <laughs> Have we lost you yet? Yeah, I... <laughs> this is no, like no I'm other radio show in the world. <laughs> I was going to say, can, the, can my E be for everywhere? Because I feel like I'm everywhere right now. <laughs> well, yes. well, we're just glad you stayed here and didn't make a run for it while we were doing your introduction. <laughs> Especially since everybody here has ADD. So. Um, oh, perfect. <laughs> so we can all fit in well. 
And not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, so, Daniel, um, you're, are you uh, are you local in Los Angeles? You're somewhere else. Where where are you located? I'm up in the Bay Area. So uh, my brother is in LA, but I'm up in uh, the Bay Area in Oakland. And how long have you been there? About seven years. Before that, I was in uh, Chicago. And it's uh, some interesting places. Sorry to hear about that. So um, now. <laughs> <laughs> getting so what is your background you know um everybody so our show each week we interview a startup company to try to bring a new concept to the audience uh we also try to teach people business lessons through you know starting a business and and what they did you know right and wrong and what they would do if, differently if they could so l let's go a little bit back before we get into the company that you currently have i just want to know what was your background prior to getting to the company that you founded in the last few years? <laughs> well, I, I want to say uh, you're both right. I, I, I was an artist, and then I needed a real job, so I became a front-end engineer. <laughs> well, that's why they say starving <laughs> artist. Yeah, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went to SEIC, which uh, they joke is stands for starving artist in Chicago. It's um, it's, it's like a fine art college. It's It's pretty cool, but they don't teach you anything uh, that you can use once you graduate. Um, and so I, I, all I knew was Photoshop, and I just took it from there. Uh, design, engineering, uh, then made it to Silicon Valley, and then a little stint as an Uber driver, and then next thing you know, I'm running this company. So everyone that wants to start a, a company that's worth millions and millions of dollars, you need to be an Uber driver first, okay? That's the key. <laughs> I'd actually recommend that, it's un unironically, but it's a different story. Well, m the engineer here may become an Uber driver very shortly. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. There's no empathy in that. There is no empathy in that. Why? That's how you start a million-dollar company. you got to become an Uber driver and, you know, like empathize with other people and in that, in that area when you're trying to, you know, hey, i got three carrots today, I'm, I'm rich, and I can eat today. <laughs> And then you become, you know what, I'm the starving artist, and I need to create something. So um, we're going to go right into what you started because we have had a little bit of a, I don't know, someone around here is kind of getting off point. So let, let's try to focus. Someone has to be the adult in the room. Is there an adult oh. here? Yeah. Is there an adult here? I don't know. We'll, we'll try to find I'm one. I'm glad <laughs> for Ray. It's, it's radio, so you can't see my eye roll. Well, I can't wait till the podcast comes out. Anyway, um, uh, the podcast is out. No, this show, today's show. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Where's your bading? Don't you have a bading? <laughs> I mean, I have like I'm a drum so roll. Do that. <laughs> Hold on. I oh my God! I'll be, falling, I'll be falling asleep by the time you find that drum roll. Let's go to our hey, why guest. Don't we have why don't we have ethics as one of our E's? Because I thought you were questioning my work ethic. That's why I was defensive. <laughs> I mean, if you want, if you want it, I got, a, I got like a. Hey, I'm an attorney. We don't have ethics. Oh. All right. So, um... <laughs> how about we get back to Daniel? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, Daniel, um, what is the name of your company first, and then uh, after you tell us the name of the company, what does the what kind of business is it, and how did you get it started? Yeah, so uh, first it was an advertising agency, actually. So um, after getting out of the Uber, I was like, you know what? I, I really like working with people one-on-one, -on -one, helping them, going the extra mile. It's really rewarding. Uh, so I started a um, consulting business, turned it into an ad agency. And, uh, you know, the mixture between tech and art was – uh, really cool because it also made money. So it was like my dream job. Uh, tech uh, plus art equals money. It was like I was in heaven. And then basically the uh, uh, the pandemic hit and everyone, uh, the first thing they got rid of was the ad agency. So I was like, wow, if we're going to survive, uh, we got to take this software we have, which is, you know, unlike any other, uh, we got to become a software company because uh, this, this is not going away. And, uh, yeah, we, we buckled down, we redid the software and made it a platform and, uh, got people to jump on board, invest in it. And, uh, that's the software company now. It's, it's, uh, 
You can plug it into anything anywhere in the world. Uh, your advertising making money. It'll tell you where, why, how, and how to make more of it. And that's pretty much the entire thing. Okay. Well, you so you have an ad agency. Ad agencies typically make revenue off of booking ads for people, and they usually get a commission. That's a, the typical traditional ad agency works, not a digital agency. Uh, you have an agency, and you're looking for clients that are have advertising. How does it become a software company? I mean, we're talking apples and oranges, and my engineer can't even add two plus three. <laughs> well, well, remember my background is in software. So before the Uber, I did you know six seven years where um, I was solving stuff for you know Boeing and Johnson and Johnson and uh, Electronic Arts and you know just doing whatever the boss needed me to do. And in this case, we just went to our customers and said, hey, you know. If you can't afford a full agency anymore, what, what can you afford? And they said, we really love your software. You know, can we use your software and, you know, not hire you at your full price? And so we just said, okay, well, it's 10% of the money, but only 1% of the work. So even if we, you know, are walking away from, uh, you know, these big budget clients, uh, we can support a thousand of these agencies in our sleep because of software, and and that was the big risk. And but it was the only way we were going to make it essentially, and it worked. Well, what does the software do? So, have you ever um, have you ever run like an e-commerce store or a crowdfunding campaign um, where you're you know selling T-shirts or uh, crowdfunding the next big thing? Well, I, I've I've run a an online store, yes. Yeah, and, and you've got some basic analytics, and you might run some ads, and it's not really clear how they're related, and you might hire an agency to help you out. Well, that agency has a giant Excel spreadsheet of, you know, how they're going to go out there on the Internet or, you know, on different channels and bring in some revenue. And their, you know, their paycheck relies on getting those numbers right, and it's all done in Excel, and it takes, you know, hundreds of hours a month. And what we did is we automated the entire thing because we have a software background. We did it for ourselves. And the product of the first uh, iteration of the product was going to other agencies and saying, hey, we automated this entire process, you know, where instead of, you know, having dinner with your friends or your family, you're in Excel. Do you want us to automate this for you? And that was uh, that was the product. So, but I I'm still having a little difficulty understanding. The product is helps advertisers analyze the success of an ad. Is that what it does? Yeah, yeah. So basically, if you say I'm selling, you know, a toaster in Ohio, you run uh, ads all over the world. They tell you which ad is working, why, what platform, what country, um, so you don't have to do any of these measurements yourself. And what type of measurements would you be doing? Well, there's, um, have you heard of uh, A-B testing in advertising? Yes, yes. Yeah, so essentially the results of that are right now just tracked in Excel and, you know, they put it in PowerPoint. and It's all done by hand. It's sort of a – it's very much an art more than a science. And all of the parts where you have to, uh, you know, do these, uh, do these measurements by hand, we just automated all of it which speeds up the process so you can basically handle a lot more business at once and uh, all your clients can essentially just see the results immediately. So what, what exactly does the software do? It analyzes. Give me the, the features that this software has. Yeah, so for example, um, if, you're, if you're in Facebook and you want to know, you know how much money did this ad make, uh, Facebook is going to hide that from you. They're going to tell you how many clicks and likes and shares it got, which you know don't really pay the bills. Uh, but if you dig into the data, it'll actually tell you how much money it made, and when and why. And uncovering that data was the first thing the software did, just to bring it front and center. And then actually elaborating on it and saying, okay, this is the country, this is the day, this is you know some basic um, some basic analysis on it, um, like telling you which exact ad worked and why, what are people reacting to, plugging that into, uh, uh, plugging into Facebook and getting that data and showing you what you really need to know, that's essentially what it does. 
and does it work for uh, any, um, like Google AdWords, Instagram? I mean, is it across the board or is it just working just for Facebook or wh what is different platforms that it works with? Yeah, so right now uh, it's Facebook and Google, and our next one is most likely uh, TikTok. Uh, we were going to do Pinterest and Reddit and a couple of others, but those platforms aren't uh, really advanced enough uh, to have APIs yet. Now, you mentioned Facebook. Does that include Instagram because it is owned by Instagram, uh, by Facebook? Yep, yeah. Yeah, sorry, the Facebook ecosystem. So Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, Messenger. Uh, what about Snapchat? I know that that's a newer platform, but that also is uh, some people are, are trying to advertise on there, depending on their audience. Is that in the in the wheel? Or? Yeah, Snapchat and uh, uh, TikTok are are two that at least for us are similar in their ad platforms, but we're most likely going to do TikTok first because it's just a bigger platform. And. Um, so right now you're selling software mainly to what, to advertising agencies or, or to predominantly to owners of businesses? Are you trying to sell it to the Boeings of the world or are you trying to sell it to the, uh, you know, Thomas Jones advertising agency? So anyone can use it, but we found that ad agencies understand the problem the fastest and uh, it's sort of a painkiller for them rather than a nice-to-have because uh, they are – I think the average person doesn't spend, you know, 100 hours a month on Excel, but ad agencies do. Uh, so there are early adopters, um, you know, while we're while we're sort of uh, expanding uh, for individual businesses and teams to do it. Does the software use artificial intelligence to come up with reports and information, or is it just gathering uh, and documenting the data quicker and then still relying upon humans to actually go through the data for analysis? So it does a little bit of both. So um, the the thing it's really good at is pulling massive amounts of information and just giving you, you know, a little situational awareness of, you know, what's going on. Uh, and on top of that, yeah, our, our, we're, we're collaborating with another startup right now where they can actually read the entire comment section and, and give you like a machine learning analysis of what the sentiment actually is. So you don't have to read, you know, a thousand comments. And, um, what, what does it have any other features besides analysis for about an ad? Uh, what are the other features that it would have? Yeah, so there's a couple of things sort of in the pipeline where we'll start doing things automatically. Um, like if a, a, you know, in the stock market, there's like a stop loss uh, feature if your stock goes down too fast. Yep. Yeah, so stuff like that where there's like, little helpers that'll let you, you know, put some things on autopilot, so understand them and put them on autopilot is uh, what we're starting to build. How about for ads? So, for instance, uh, if you're running an ad and you're spending, you know, $10 per click, you know, and, and you got a $10,000 budget and it's coming up really quickly, are there ways to that, that it can work with that type of a system or program to modify? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so we're starting to figure out that, um, you know, people don't want to think about this stuff. So if a, um, if a cost per click is too high and, or if the, the revenue from an ad is too low, uh, if, if the ROI starts going negative, that, you know, you have like an automatic off for it. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that to me seems more like a stop loss to me. Uh, that, that approach, you know, that uh, you've either gone above your budget, below your budget, or you're not getting a good enough return. Then you know you need to do something. So full stop. Um, this information is going to, when it's sold to the ad agency. The ad agency do they have the option to share it with the client, or do they just uh, typically keep it for themselves and then just send out a report to the client? Yeah. So essentially, it's their own information that they already have. Um, so we're actually plugging into their own data. Um, so it's their own data. Uh, presented, you know, super quickly, like click of a button. Um, and then they have asked for white labeling, which is basically taking reporting off their hands so their clients can just log in um, and they never have to write a report again. And um, what is the typical cost for a program like this? 
So we're doing a little bit of value-based pricing, but we've we found that an agency with, let's say, three clients a month uh, will be happy paying three four hundred dollars a month. Uh, an agency with 15 clients at any given time will pay, you know, a thousand bucks a month. So we used to have a flat rate that was like agencies a thousand bucks a month. Um, but now we're working with agencies and, and we do more like um, value-based pricing. So an agency with three versus 15 clients at any time, um, they'll pay about a hundred bucks a month per active client to take reporting and analysis off their hands. Um, and, and one last question. So is the contract terminable that you can terminate it in 30 days or, or is it yearly or how does that work? Yeah, so we um, it's month to month and you get like a nice discount for doing it yearly and paying up front. It's sort of like uh, other software. So um, right now it's it's around uh, nine, 100 bucks per client per month uh, and you can cancel any time. Um, but we're giving like a, a 50% discount if you – basically pay for a year. Uh, we're we're um, doing some larger yearly contracts, but, you know, we move quickly and we like uh, making sure our clients are happy. So knowing once a month if we're doing a, a good job is, um, uh, I like that more personally than knowing once a year. All right. Well, thank you very much. We'll be right back. It was in KHS 1220, 98.1 FM. Your business sign is essential to getting customers to your location. Feathers can help you get your business noticed. Feathers, now in a new larger space with plenty of parking. They walk you through each phase of your project with special attention to detail and quality. Feathers will provide you a sign that you can be proud of. Your sign will draw customers in instead of having them drive by. Visit Feathers online at feathersigns.com or go to Feathers' brand new bigger location at 26017 Huntington Drive off Rye Canyon or call 298-9442. If you have a business problem, if someone doesn't honor their agreement and you need an aggressive attorney with over 27 years experience, the law office of Peter Bronstein has helped partners resolve disputes, franchisees resolve disputes, and other business owners who have a challenge. Let the law office of Peter Bronstein take your stress away. Visit lacorporateattorney.com. Don't wait too long and lose your rights. Solve your business challenge problem today. Visit lacorporateattorney.com. Save water and save money. SCV Water wants to help you find your fit and take advantage of conservation rebate programs that will help you save. Water your landscape more efficiently. Replace your lawn with water-wise plants. Conduct free in-home water surveys. Cover your swimming pool and more. Find the programs that fit your needs and start saving today. Visit conserve.yourscvwater.com to learn more. That's conserve.yourscvwater.com. Hometown, your hometown station. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You're listening to KHS 1220 and 98.1 FM. And we have a great, great show, as we do each week, where we are talking to a business owner who has created a great product. Anyone who has an ad out there on Facebook, has an ad out there on Google, or is working uh, for an ad agency, uh, I think this product is very good for you. Uh, it'll help you out in analyzing tons and tons of data on your Excel. And, you know, we never got through that famous words that we always start the show with. Uh, but without any further ado, how do you spell ado? A-D-I-E-U. And why do I like that word? Because it has a lot of vowels in it. That's actu actually correct. So for that, I have to go into my fish tank and get a little fish to throw it to the seal. Here you go. You didn't catch it. <laughs> Put it over your head. <laughs> All right, mm. we're back. We're back, and we're better than ever. And on top of that, we're going to let our co-host ask questions while I take a snooze and throw in a couple of sarcastic remarks every now and then for our great interview with Daniel. And by the way, Tracy, you haven't even asked 
So I will ask, what is the website for this great software? I'm just about to ask that question. Oh, so you snooze, you lose. <laughs> yes, Daniel. Um, what is, and you might want to also spell it too because it has a little bit of an unusual domain. So what is the website for Aphrodite? Oh, it's uh, Aphrodite.io. So A P H. R O D I T E dot I O. And uh, if you need to find it on Google, just uh, Google Aphrodite Analytics. It'll be the first thing. I can't do Love green, it. I can't do green M&Ms. What? Green, uh, okay, this green is my turn. Green this M&Ms is... are an aphrodisiac. Okay, go ahead. Okay, whatever, <laughs> Daniel. Um, okay, just focus over here, Daniel. Just focus over here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, um, so I was, you know, you pretty much had me at your story about thinking that um, Steve Jobs was more interesting than Jackson Pollock. But I want to know if, when you were going to art school, is this is it a true story that you saw the iPod in the uh, MoMA and made that and drew that conclusion for yourself? Yeah, it's. Uh, I even remember when, which was, um, uh, it must have been. 2009, 2008, maybe the, the iPhone hadn't come out and Mo MoMA had some design stuff, you know, and, and the CD was in there and the iPod is in there. Um, and, you know, th there's like a big hoopla about what's art and what's not art in art school and everyone's, you know, very pretentious. And uh, that business could be art was just like, you know, really wild. And, and, and that sort of stopped me in my track that that was in an art museum. Well, and what was your primary medium of art? I'm just curious. I was a photographer. So I, I, I did photography, um, which, you know, we're very different than the painters in, in the fashion department because um, we're, we're sort of one, uh, one foot in the art world and one foot in technology because, you know, to, to uh, operate a camera and develop a film, it's a, it's a technological process. Well, I really feel like uh, when you review your website, and I encourage everybody who's listening to go and check it out, it, it to me, I can totally tell that you have this aesthetic for design and that you, and it has that advertising, it looks like an advertising agency created it. Your branding is really strong. Tell me about your tagline, we specialize in the impossible, because on your website, you say, since the very beginning, pursuing the impossible has been fundamental to our culture. How does that translate over? And without a doubt, please help me understand the recruiting tool of the Rubik's Cube. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> so um, our original name, uh, uh, our original logo, the, the, the logo had our ad agency name. And the tagline, we specialize in the impossible. And, and when, we, um, when we switched to uh, being a software company, we renamed the company Lost That Slogan. Um, so it was missing for about six months. Um, and actually just a week ago, uh, uh, we were like, you know, that, that was actually a big part of what we do. We should put it back on there. Um, so that's, um, that's the story of the slogan. And the origin is um, I've just always been a big problem solver. And um, I'm, uh, I'm pretty ADD, uh, you know, like you guys were saying. And uh, the harder a problem gets, the better my concentration so I'm really, uh, you know, not that great at basic tasks, but give me something impossible and, you know, focused uh, uh, as anything else. So that's, that's how I came up with it because, you know, it, it is true. And uh, the Rubik's Cube is a bit of a, uh, a, a sort of a personal story, which is uh, after graduating art school, I think I told you we were, we were all going to go work at Starbucks. <laughs> Um, <laughs> we, <laughs> you know, our, well, I heard they have good insurance. They do. Our engineers trying to get a job there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's like you know, you go to the, one of the best art schools in the world, and then you go work at Starbucks, and it's like seems like a you know, it's it's cool, but it's like not really what I came to America for. Um, and and um, I picked up a Rubik's cube, and I was like, you know, if I can solve this thing, I can. I can, I can do other stuff. And so I just learned how to do it. And I think it took me like two days. Um, 
And after that, I was like, all right, I know, I know how to do something that's not art and I can follow instructions. So I'm going to go <laughs> start my career now. Um, and, and that's like, um, that's, that's sort of a lesson I always kept with myself and uh, with all my engineers that I worked um, with at other companies, I had them do it, that everyone on my team had to learn how to do that, which is just like, if you just, you know, something that you think is great only for geniuses, if you sit down for two days and just figure it out, you can do it too. Um, and that was so important at my teams that I ran at other startups that when I had my own company, I was like, you know what, everybody, everybody's uh, uh, going to have to do this. And it brings the whole team together. Um, people are like really, you know, they can rely on each other to figure it out. It's a, it's a big part of who we are. Well, I guess you actually answered my next question, which was going to be, so I thought that you had to be able to do the Rubik's Cube in order to get the job with your company. But now what I'm hearing you say is that you will hire somebody if they can't do it, but they have to learn how to do it, which is really, I think that's so impressive in terms of just like a fun but really tactical way to get people to also show their commitment to wanting to be a problem solver. Yeah, and and there are people who you know said um, I'll never be able to do this, and then there are people who said I already know how to do this. <laughs> so, uh, for instance, um, uh, Ma Maggie on our website, um, uh, she already knew how to do it. Um, and our, our newest um, our newest hire, he's not on the website yet. His name is Dio. Uh, he's our customer service person, and he was like, I'm never going to be able to do this. And you know, you, you walk, I uh, walked him through it. I said, you know, this is, uh, it's part of it. And I showed him a couple things and it, it's sort of, uh, you know, it brings everyone together, which is especially important. I've found that when I haven't met half the company because everything's remote. And so when you were very first, at the beginning of the show, you were talking about the pivot that you made from from running and owning, I guess, an ad agency to moving into this technology space, um, that's a pretty big pivot in a short period of time. So what have been some of your growth strategies as a result of that pivot to get you where you are, I guess, what, a year later? Yeah, so we knew that um, uh, for for a while revenue was going to go down either way, you know, because everyone's marketing budget just went to zero you know, last, starting last summer and uh, it picked up, um, you know, a couple of months ago again. Um, so we knew that for, let's say, between April and January, revenue was going to be really hard. So our only, you know, way of surviving was investment, essentially. So that's, um, uh, that's how we basically kept ourselves alive. We sold 10% of the company, explained what we wanted to do, and um, a couple of investors really saw it, and now the main source of revenue is, you know, we've been around, we've made connections as an agency that um, some of the people we showed it to, they were just like, oh, yeah, your, your like, secret weapon that you were using, I can buy that now? Yeah, I'll, I'll buy that. That's amazing. So I would love to ask you if you work with any um, – analytics around podcasting. I, you may not know this about me, but I, um, shameless self-promotion, own a podcast production marketing agency called Producer Podcast. And so analytics are a really challenging thing with the podcast listener. And I'm just curious if that's anything that you've ever thought about delving into, because talking about um, solving the impossible, it's the wild, wild west right now because agencies are interested in buying advertising on podcasts, but the analytics are really, really hard to track. That sounds pretty interesting. I, I, I got to say, um, the, we were going to do television in a few years, uh, waiting for that to be connected. But if podcasting is a thing that needs it now, that you know, we're, we're uh, sounds like we might be up to bat. Well, see, I have just solved the impossible for your next step. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I owe you. I owe you. Where, where do I send the champagne? 
Uh, well, but it is, I mean, in all seriousness, you, know, look, you can tell how many people have listened to your podcast and how many people have subscribed, you know, not even, it's really even difficult to tell how many people have subscribed versus how many people have listened. But the qualitative data is, is, is a true problem that's out there right now that the first person who solved it and are, with an already existing relationship with ad agencies, that is going to be a really big coup because, there's um, the amount of spending and advertising went from 459 million to over a billion just in the course of from 2019 to 2020. So, I mean, that is a really big trajectory of growth for agencies to spend and buy podcasts. But as you know, being an owner of an agency, they have to check the box on all of that qualitative data. So I'm here to tell mm-hmm. you that perhaps we should work together on that. <laughs> Yeah, sure. I mean, that sounds good. It's and it's a really interesting problem because, um, uh, you know, forgive me if I'm speaking out of turn, but I'm I'm assuming it's going to be similar to, you know, uh, Instagram, which is, you know, some people on Instagram have you know 10 million followers and can't sell you know 10 T-shirts, and some people have 10 million followers on Instagram and can move product like there's no tomorrow. So why people listen to the podcast and you know, why people uh, decide to buy something. Um, I'm assuming that's like a total, you know, no man's land or or nobody really knows what's going on uh, uh, under the hood. Well, yes, it's that. And it's also just being able to tell like what percentage of your audience is male versus female. I mean, it gets down to just being that basic. It's like, it's very difficult to tell. The only thing that you can really grab a hold of right now is geographical data. You can tell if someone listens where that wherever they are in the world you can take it from u.s to state to city but you can't tell what their socioeconomic status is you can't tell if they're male or female you can't i mean there are lots of of rooms for improvement and being able to then niche those buys that basically the only way you can niche a buy from an agency to a podcast right now is by the topic and an assumptive topic is female targeted. So therefore you would place ads in a female um, targeted topic podcast. So it, it really is a wide open space uh, for you that would be interesting to, to pursue. Um, but I guess, and that brings me to my next question, which is what is next for Africa? Uh, you mentioned television. What would be different in television with Nielsen ratings than or Arbitron ratings for radio, for example, than what you would be able to provide? Well, sort of the, the way that Internet advertising works is, is slowly starting to take over everything else, which is um, the um, uh, when you put something on, you know, a, a banner ad or a TV, it's very similar. It's just, you know, show this to a million people. It's kind of like a billboard. Um, but some of these, uh, uh, some of these, Newer platforms, they really track um, not who's buying more than what's selling. So, you know, a picture of, um, you know, a, a certain photo of your um, a product might really, really get people interested. And the other one might, you know, they might be turned off by it and be like, ah, I don't want this. And knowing exactly what moment is working, that's, uh, I think, going to come to television, for instance. So, like, when you see an ad and, you know, someone turns the volume down or it's just like, oh, I don't want to see this again, that kind of feedback, um, the the person putting on the ad really wants to know that. They really want to know, like, this specific thing um, makes people say, you know, I, I, I don't want this. And it's on YouTube now. So on YouTube, you can see, like, oh, okay, this is where the person tuned out and said, uh, no, not for me. Um, and I think that's going to come to television. That's going to come to all sorts of other stuff. Um, and it, it, it sounds weird or it, it might sound like, you know, you're being spied on. I, th- I think it's more about um, what's, what's selling rather than who's buying, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, I think we all kind of know that Big Brother's watching us anyway. It's just to one degree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But that's a whole other topic for a whole other day. Um, and it's, it's, it seems like you work with agencies of all sizes. So do you work with independents all the way up to, like, the big firms out of New York and L.A.? Or, or is that your – are you targeting more of the smaller independent firms? What is your target agency client? 
<laughs> yeah, so um, in in um, other startups I've worked at that have grown, we usually start with uh, you know small medium business, um, and, and then work our way up. Uh, that way, when you get to the enterprise level, you know it's 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 been uh, polished all the way. So right now, our ideal customer is they've got between three and fifteen clients at any given time. They're trying to juggle it all, and they're trying to get back to everyone and, um, you know, give everyone as much accurate information as possible. And they're just overwhelmed by it. You know, they, they're, they're sitting in Excel and overwhelmed by how many numbers they have to report. Um, and those are the people we really love working with um, because they just get it right away and it solves the most problems right away. And that means we get to, you know, find out um, is this something – uh, uh, like what is the most valuable part of this? What could we make even better? And the really cool thing about small uh, small businesses is uh, if if they don't like something, they'll tell you. You know, <laughs> they're, right? They're, they're, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're just like, oh, thank you. You know, let's let's fix that or let's add this. And the feedback is just much faster and more honest. So um, that's our ideal customer right now. We're, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back. I'm listening to KHS 1220 98.1 FM. Healthcare can be difficult if you're underinsured or have Medi-Cal. Samuel Dixon Family Health Center can help. Services are available on a sliding fee schedule. The mission of the Samuel Dixon Family Health Center is to give the Santa Clarita Valley access to affordable, quality primary care. There are three locations to serve you, Canyon Country, Newhall, and Valverde. Go to sdfhc.org for more information and to find the location most convenient for you. If you have a business problem, if someone doesn't honor their agreement and you need an aggressive attorney with over 27 years experience, the Law Office of Peter Bronstein has helped partners resolve disputes, franchisees resolve disputes, and other business owners who have a challenge. Let the Law Office of Peter Bronstein take your stress away. Visit LACorporateAttorney.com. Don't wait too long and lose your rights. Solve your business challenge problem today. Visit LACorporateAttorney.com. Great health care just got easier and more convenient in Canyon Country. Facey Canyon Country is now open directly off the Soledad Canyon exit off the 14 freeway. The 37,000 square foot clinic houses Facey Medical Group primary care physicians, pediatricians, and specialists. Facey has easy 24-7 online appointment scheduling for PCPs and PEDS. For more information or to make an appointment, visit Facey.com. That's F-A-C-E-Y dot com. It's like no other station I've ever listened to. It's great. Your, your hometown station. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You listen to KHS 1220 98.1 FM. Like no other station in the world. All right, we're back. We just have a few more minutes left today, about five and a half, six and a half. I don't know. I can't add. I don't have that software he has. Aphrodite IO. Anyway, Tracy, go. So before the break, we were talking about the ability to move into television, and then you mentioned YouTube in terms of some of the practices that they already had in place. So are you, can you help us understand, is there a connection between the Google Analytics and YouTube since they, you know, obviously Google owns YouTube, and does that, is that an, a benefit in terms of being able to leverage YouTube, and how does that work? Yeah, so YouTube has, you know, um, some basic analytics. It's it's pretty good. The um, um, We're able to plug into it and get some uh, basic information like how long are people watching, you know, are they, you know, doing other stuff? Do they immediately say, okay, skip this ad? Um, so have you ever seen those YouTube ads that there's ones you skip and there's ones that, you know, get it right, and for some reason you don't skip it, you just watch it? Um and yeah, and then the you forget you're seconds. watching a commercial. Yeah, you forget you're watching yeah, yeah, a commercial yeah. that you can skip it. Absolutely. 
Yeah, or like, I mean, Geico, for instance, uh, my favorite YouTube ad is Geico, where like they just made an ad in five seconds, and they're like, we're skipping our own ad, so you don't have to. Um, so th- those are the results of some of those analytics where they're like, you know what? Um, instead of making a three-minute ad that nobody skips, they might have seen in the data that just making a five-second ad uh, is enough. And um, we've plugged into some of that, um, and, it, and it's something – um, you know, we really want to do, but on the website, you'll see we're just four people. So uh, it's, we've got to do one thing at a time, if that makes sense. Yeah, I did see that you have a very small but mighty team, and and they also have all of their pictures of themselves with their with their Rubik's cubes, which is, I guess, you know, the photographer in you probably had some fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> um so when you were mentioning before that basically um, from a financial perspective, you're sustainable right now with your investment um, and your investors, 10% of the company, was it difficult for you? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced in getting investor capital? And what do you think that it was about Aphrodite that solidified investor capital so quickly? Yeah, I mean, um, in the in the last six months, you know, we, we became profitable again, which is really awesome. Um, and, and then I think in the I think in the meantime, um, just telling uh, just just telling people, you know, I've I've personally done software for ten years. Um, I I've done you know stuff for Electronic Arts, Japan Airlines, and you know the the uh, Boeing has, you know, emailed me to fix their stuff. And um, just that experience, having, having, I was lucky enough to have that experience. Uh, they were like, okay, well, um, you know, if you give me a good deal, I'm in. And then you just, um, you just got to be honest with yourself and be like, yeah, I'm, I'm sure other people would, would say selling 10% of your company is crazy, but it's what we had to do. And uh, everybody liked the deal and, um, they got a good deal. We got a good deal, and um, now um, you know it, it, that's just the the way it is. And uh, that's you know part of business, just being like we got to do this to uh, make it to next year. And now we're doing really well again, and the investors that bought that chunk of the company are are pretty happy. <laughs> So you've got a student who's graduating from any school, doesn't necessarily be, have to be art school, grad school, working at Starbucks with a great idea. What is the one thing that you would say to that person um, right now? Drive an Uber. <laughs> <laughs> smart. Very smart answer. Smart. I would have done the same thing. He's on point. And, uh, and and the here here's the real thing. Well, if you're under 25, you you can't do the like pro move, which is to rent a car to drive an Uber. So I I, I met one Uber driver who, who had the ultimate hack. He rented a car for maybe five bucks an hour and made 20 bucks an hour driving a, a Uber. So he didn't even put miles on his own car. But yeah, you 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 meet a lot of people. You learn how to talk to people, care about people. Uh, you know, go the extra mile. And the coolest part is, you know, you, you, you'll meet 500 people that you never thought you would meet in your own city. It's, it's, it's kind of awesome. Wow. I'm, we, um, Brian, this is the first time we've ever had that be the tip for, an entrepre- for a wannabe entrepreneur starting a business, but it makes a lot of sense, <laughs> especially the brilliant person who rents a car and then monetizes it that way. I want to hire that person because that person is innovative as can be. Well, we have 40, 40 <laughs> seconds left to ask a question and answer a question. So. Well, I I just want to say, you know, how can people find you? Are you looking for people to hire? Are you, you know, what is the one thing that you have a need for that you can ask for um, out of our audience today? Besides Rubik's Cube uh, completion. <laughs> Rubik's Cube <laughs> expertise. <laughs> yeah, I would I would say uh, if you want to if you want to follow our uh, professional uh, stuff that's on LinkedIn, just look up uh, Aphrodite. That's uh, the first thing. We'll, we post jobs on there. And if you want to follow our day-to-day, uh, just us having fun on Instagram, we're at Aphrodite.io, same as our website. Thank you very much. We had a great show, KGS 1220, 98.1 FM. <laughs>